Jesus was a rock star. So if you would just uh, pray with me, say, Jesus, help me to be what you want me to be. Do what you want me to do. Because people without you go to hell. We want God to take our selfish hearts and make us selfless people. There's a real irony here. I don't remember if I, I think I talked about this last week. It's one of those things I'm probably going to say every week because it's so incredibly important. God is full of paradox, you know? If, if you want to lead, you need to be the servant. You know, if you want to uh, be blessed, you've got to be open-handed and give. If you, uh, God is just full of things that are counterintuitive. And this selfless series that we're doing right now is a little counterintuitive because the most selfish thing you could ever do in this world is to be selfless. Because when you're selfish, you never quite have enough. You're always living to get that little bit of more. But when you get to the place where you become like Jesus and you become selfless, that you're like, I'm gonna bless you before I bless myself. I'm gonna, it's, it's, the, uh, it's, the, it's the fish love that we had last week. Wasn't that cool, my little rabbi friend? I should show that video every week this week. The more you watch it, the deeper it gets. But so much, of, and, but the thing that really, I found the most profound about that video, now I wish I had it in, this, in the sermon here, was he said that when you, the re, real love is when you put some of yourself in that other person, and because everyone loves themselves, now you have a love for them because you poured yourself into them. And that, anyway, it's, it's just really kind of neat. But so much of love is, is fish love that we call love. In other words, we, 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 we kill the fish, we eat the fish. Anyway, I, I, it, it's really good. But selflessness is the most selfish thing that you could ever do because then you are just free. You get, to, you get to bless other people, you get to pour out, and, and then that is more satisfying than all of the stuff you could buy for yourself, all the time that you could, buy, you could spend on yourself. What you do for somebody else and the joy that that brings is better. It doesn't seem like it at first, and therein, again, is God's paradox and wisdom. You know, you can boil all the wisdom down to one principle. And that principle is giving up something you want now for something better later. It's wisdom not to sin. Well, you want that sin? You want that thing right now? Because you want the blessing of God later. I, I challenge you. I've tried to, to think of some kind of wisdom that didn't come down to that one principle. That if I give up something I want now, I get to have something better later and that's what we're doing here it was the selflessness if you think of some wisdom that isn't that let me know because i have yet to, to find one okay and I, and I very well could be wrong but but so much of lives is chasing after something that we want and, and i do this too i've been teasing about the barbecue grill i've been saving up money for this barbecue grill for over a year a little bit here a little there uh, and and been conniving ways to get cash for it and and i'm planning a long time uh, uh for it and, and, and we obsess if only i can get this barbecue grill then my life is going to be complete then everything will be cooked uh perfectly it's just the satisfaction that i'm going for it's just around the corner i'm going to be able to set that dial and it's going to be smoked perfectly and, and just around the corner is there'll be that something that's going to make it all happen and we alluded to this last week man as soon as i'm done with college 
then life is going to start. Everything is going to be great. As soon as I get married, well, then everything is, is, is going to be awesome and, and it's going to be easy. But around every corner, around every new boat, around every new barbecue grill, around every new, uh, new job that you're going for, as if you are living a selfish life instead of a selfless life, you get around that corner, you reach that mountaintop that you thought would be the pinnacle of everything, and you look around and it's just not enough. Culture says gratify yourself, indulge yourself, and treat yourself. That's what our culture says to do. All of advertising is to make you bigger, better looking, and, and happier, right? But Jesus has a different perspective, and this is God's wisdom that is counterintuitive, but if you can do it, you're going to live the happiest life. And that is deny yourself. Deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Because when you deny yourself and you pour your life into other people and the ones that Jesus loves, because the selflessness is happiness. I have to check something here. It's possible that, oh no, this is the right sermon, okay. Sometimes I work on a few at a time and then I forget what I'm doing, but this is the right one, okay. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. The prize in, in God's economy, the prize isn't something that's out there. The prize has already been won. The, but the prize that God wants for you is not something that you just get occasionally. He wants you to have a prize that you get to walk in daily. So success, that thing that you want, doesn't have to be something off in the difference. What if the work was the reward? What if the prize was in the process? What if you could be grateful in the grind? Whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. See, because the prize and the satisfaction and the joy that God wants you to have, that isn't something that you have to get good enough to get. That isn't something that you have to attain, something new to enjoy. It's something that can bubble up out of you because of who your God is and how He loves you. The prize is in the daily grind, the what if. Check this out. This is Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He knew something about hardship. He said, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. That's because this guy, before he gave his life to Jesus, his main job, his job, he, literally, he, the, his employment, he was given letters and told, go kill Christians. And he was doing that. The Bible says at one point, he was heading off a stoning of a bunch of Christians, and it was actually the first uh, martyr, and they, uh, it was Stephen, and they, they grabbed up the clothes, and, and Paul, as a young man, is watching the clothes and making sure nobody steals the stuff for the people that are killing Christians, or killing Stephen. So he was, he was a, a bad guy. Because I persecuted the, ch the church of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I am Popeye. No, that's not what he is. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. His grace for me was not without effect. I, now, some of you have got some dicey pasts. Some of you have done some sinful things. Some of you have got things in your life that if, if when you are feeling weak and tired, the enemy brings those thoughts back and that shame comes on you and you cringe in your heart for the things that you have done. The Apostle Paul cringed when he looked over those coats as Stephen was being murdered. He cringed when he was so violently venomous against the church of God. But the cool thing is, is when you've got something that you are saved from, when, when there is a revelation in your heart that God saved you from something awful, well, His grace is not without effect. It actually has incredibly hard effect. When you, now, uh, you don't have to do really super bad stuff. My wife, I don't think, has ever said a bad word except at me that one time. I think she was in Norwegian. Um, but, even if you have lived a nicer life than most, the reality is, is that your sin is still deplorable and that you deserve God's wrath.
The wages of sin is death. You only got to sin one time to deserve God's wrath. And so it's, it's available to all of us, but, and it doesn't have to be without effect. So what effect did it have on Paul? What is the thing that this grace and Paul realizing that I am saved from so much, I am such a deplorable, I am saved from so much, what effect did it have? These next seven words are amazing. No, he says, I worked harder than all of them. When he was saved, he's like, God, I can never repay you. And if you listen to me praying, I, I, that works its way into my prayers pretty often when I'm praying at the end of the service. God, there is, I can never repay you. There is no life I can give you that will even begin to repay what you did for me, Jesus. You loved me when I was not worth loving. And Jesus, you came for me. Well, what, so God, I take my life and I give it to you completely. You own my hopes, my dreams, my past, my future, my success, my failure. I am currency in your hand to be spent, God. I worked harder than all of them. Sometimes, if you are feeling lazy and not feeling wanting to do anything about God, the problem is, is you don't realize just how saved you are. You don't realize just how much you needed the grace and the love of God. Because when you get that in your heart, the grace and the love of God, and it's not without effect, you will work harder than all of them. But, yet not I, but the grace of God that was, within, that was with me. That's where the passion comes. You know where the joy of the Lord, the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you want to know what that joy of the Lord is? I deserved hell, and I get to be in heaven with ever, forever with my Jesus. I remember one time I was walking in a reading class. I think I probably had too much caffeine that day because I learned to drink coffee at 12 years old. I was also fully grown in the sixth grade. Uh, and so I was a big sixth grader, and, they, and my doctor told me I wasn't growing anymore, that he measured my elbow and to know I would be 5'5 five, five for the rest of my life, which is a giant in my family, if you've seen my mom and dad. Um, they're not here. <laughs> uh, the... Um, it's not giant, but I mean, anyway, my, bro my brother's the giant of the family. He's 5'6", okay, so that's how that is. Um, I had a point, I have no idea what it was. Oh, yeah, I, I, so yeah, I started drinking coffee I was, when I was 13 because I was trying to keep up with my 19-year-old co cousin who would come home at 2 o'clock in the morning and then go out and paint houses the next morning. And uh, one time I fell asleep on, we were, we were painting a deck and I, and I had this steel brush and I was steel brushing the deck and I put my head down and I fell asleep on the deck while steel brushing with the steel brush as my pillow. So that was, that was uh, 13 year old Scott. But I started drinking coffee early on and so what I, my, my habit was, is I would get up early in the morning, I would make the coffee the night before and I would put it in a glass thermos and I would have it by my bed. And then my alarm would go off at five o'clock because I would pray and read my Bible before I went to school. And it was perfect because overnight, the coffee would get to that lukewarm temperature where it's not quite gross yet, but, and you can drink it really fast. And so I would pound down a thermos of coffee as quickly as I could so I could get all juiced after praying and read my Bible. Well, I came into reading class one day and my, and my teacher stops me and says, Scott, what, what, you are, he, how are you so happy all the time? And without missing a beat, I said, well, Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He rose from the dead and I get to be forever in heaven with him. <laughs> oh. He was like, it was ca Jesus caffeine. We, we used to call it prayer juice because it helped you pray more. Anyway, but that is where the passion comes. When you really know, when you feel the grace that he has given you, when you are a murderer of Christians and the grace comes, when you are somebody that, that has done things that needed forgiven, man, there's, you'll work harder than anybody else. You'll work harder than anybody else. Not I, but the grace. But that's the grace. The grace of God that was with me. Now, Paul, he knew sacrifice. He would be shipwrecked. He would be beaten. He was stoned. Uh, one time he was stoned so badly they thought they killed him and either God raised him from the dead or they just didn't check him good enough because after being stoned, he got up and walked away. I mean, he, he knew. He was imprisoned. He was shipwrecked. Um, all of these things. So Paul, it'd be fun to talk to Paul. You know, sit down and if we're sitting by a campfire, some of you guys are going camping this summer. I hope to do more camping this summer. 
And sitting around the fire, he, he'd be drinking wine and I'd be drinking a Diet Coke because in the Assemblies of God we can't drink. Um, but the, and we were sitting around and, and uh, while other, you know, we're talking and say, Paul, how, what was it that made it that you were able to evangelize so much of the world? I think he'd lean over and say, you know, while, while some of the other guys were, were sleeping, you know, I was strategizing. I was just thinking how we're going to get the gospel out more. When other people wanted to stay and be comfortable in their cities, I was willing to be beaten, shipwrecked, got bit by a snake that one time. When other people looked for a shortcut, I did the grind day in and day out. I did the grind. I, I memorized more scripture than any of my peers. I, had, I could just quote the Bible, and then, and, and, and I did, did kind of write most of the New Testament, so that's pretty cool. Um, I, when I went to prison, I didn't get depressed. I just thought, you know, the Philippians haven't heard from me in a while. I'm going to write the Philippians a letter. He, every circumstance that Paul went in, he was grateful because he carried that grace with him. He carried that revelation that I was lost and now am found. I get to be in heaven forever with my Jesus. And so he worked tirelessly, not out of a sense of legalism, not out of a sense of insecurity that I got something to prove. He worked tirelessly because his Jesus died for him and his life was his, was Jesus is the spend. He just wanted to, to pour it out, pour it out. So. He didn't wallow, he didn't wait, he didn't wish away. Uh, he would die in prison. Uh, they would quietly take him out in a sneaky way. Most scholars believe he was, his head was cut off. Um, when he was in prison, he didn't say, hey, when I get out, I'm going to do this. When I get past this thing, I'm going to do this. When, when he was shipwrecked, he didn't think, you know what, when I get on shore, I, I'm going back to Jerusalem. This is crazy. This just, this isn't working. When Barnabas left him and took, up, uh, and took off, he didn't waste time being bitter and angry and feeling alone. He just kept on pressing on. In Corinthians, we said, whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Whether you're changing diapers, making a sales call, doing a laundry, running errands, in there with kids church right now. By the way, I was just back there right before church. We got a mess of kids back there. It is just awesome. They're doing such a good job, you guys. It's, it's just wonderful. But whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do for the glory of God. What if work was the reward? There was prize in the process. And you can be grateful in the grind. Our world wants easier, faster, better. We want that shiny new thing. And we get, we get distracted. And we look for a life of ease. We, we talk about that a lot in our house. A life of ease. There are three enemies of the true reward. Again, what's the true reward? It's that joy that bubbles up. And you work hard, not to attain nothing. It's just because you love your Jesus and it, it drives. And fun way to live too. Fun way to live. The pillow. There's three things we're gonna look at. Number one, the pillow. There is seduction in comfort. I wanna live a life of ease. I don't really wanna work anymore. Uh, God never ever called you to an easy life. If you look at every Bible character, there's not one of them that just had an easy time of it. None of them, not Jesus, not Daniel, not Joseph, none of them had a life without conflict or an easy life. Jesus called you to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. If you ever heard a preacher tell you that somehow because of something in, in God's word that God owed you a comfortable life, that if you're ever sick, either you got sin in your life or whatever, you know, uh, if, if there's something wrong with you, if, if something bad happens, that, that preacher probably just wanted your money, okay? Because that is not what the Bible says. Jesus says, pick up your cross, deny, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And of course, at that point, a lot of them would follow Jesus all the way to the cross. Peter was crucified upside down. He didn't think he was worthy of being crucified crucified in the same way as Jesus. So some of them there, many of them would give their lives for Christ. Easy never changed the world. And God has called you to be a world changer, a life changer. That destiny is on you as you sit here today. Easy never changed a life. Easy never reached into somebody whose heart was broken 
and let the Spirit of God mend it again. It's never easy. Never easy. You want to step into somebody's life and, li- and love them in Jesus' name? It's never easy because the enemy fights. He hates you. He hates that person. It's never easy. Easy never changed the world. Number two, the shiny thing. The allure of constant distractions. You can be, we, uh, we, we watched so much Netflix that last night. We're watching this troll hunter thing on Netflix. It's something the whole family can kind of watch without it. And I just read a little bit on my own. Um, and, uh, and, and Netflix a- asked us, are you still there? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, or maybe you, are, you, you get finished watch, you binge watch a series and it was a really good series like, like The Walking Dead or something like that. Um, and you, you, you binge watch a series and then it comes up and, and, and Netflix tells you there's a 99.9% chance you're going to love this series. And you're like, well, that's got to be the Spirit of God speaking to me. And so you... And so you, you go, but we are this, the next great thing. You ever go on YouTube? I do this because a lot of the stuff I do is YouTube videos and, and things. And so I'll go on YouTube to find, try to find a video for you or, a, or something like that. And, and then all of a sudden on the right hand side, there's a, a video about pandas. And my brother Mike hates pandas. He has this montage that he thinks that uh, evolution has selected them for extinction. And, uh, and he can go on and on. It's really awesome. Not that we believe in evolution around here, but uh, anyway, the uh, and I see the pandas, and I watch the pandas, and they, and, the, and then I send it to my brother because that's just a good thing to do. Um, but we get distracted by the next shiny thing. Number three, uh, the towel, because when you serve God, there is going to be a perpetual temptation to quit. Paul did. Uh, we know that. Uh, we, we know David did. You know what? Your Jesus did. The night that he was to be crucified, he, he knew he, he was about to be betrayed. And he's talking to God and, and he's praying. He prays for you in that, in that portion of scripture. He prays for all those who will believe. And then he says, Lord, um, if this cup could be taken from me, could you take this cup from me? He's basically saying, okay, I know what we're doing here, God. I'm going to die for their sins. Uh, They need us. I love them. We're in this together. But Lord, if there is any other way for us to accomplish this goal, let's do that. Because the weight was coming on him at that point. Bible says he he was sweating drops of blood. I personally believe that God was beginning to allow our sin to come upon him that he would die for. I think that that was part of that pressure. Can't prove that either way. I have to ask Jesus when you get to heaven. But he, he is, he's in despair. He is, he, he's getting to a place. He's like, God, is there any other way that we can do this? If even your Jesus wanted to throw in the towel, if there are days that you want to quit, that just means that's part of the process, you guys. There's a constant temptation to throw in the towel. And in order to get something good later, you've got to go through something hard now. Remember, that's wisdom. That's, that's the definition of wisdom. Giving up, you give up some comfort now for something awesome later. Because if you quit, you will never see the good stuff. If you quit, your relationships will never get where God wants them. If you quit, your finances will never God, get where God wants them. If you quit the lives that God wants to put you in to change their lives, it'll never happen if you quit. Because all of you are guaranteed to be tempted to quit. And the next time you're guaranteed, the, the, the next time that you want to quit, I want you to think, Pastor Scott said I'd want to quit, and I do. This happened, it was disappointing, it put me back, I don't understand this, I don't like this. God, I feel like a loser, and it, and it wouldn't have to be this way. I could just be like that, look how shiny happy that Christian is over there, God. Why can't I have his life? Why, why can't everything go good for me like it's going for him? That everything comes easy to them. God, I just want to quit. Lord, this isn't fair. You gave him that, 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 that blessing, that benefit. He can talk to anybody, and, and it's just so great, God. Why, why couldn't you make me like that? I'll show you, God. I'm not doing this anymore. I don't deserve this. I didn't sign up for this. All of these are things that have gone through in my mind. All of these are things that the enemy, at some point in time, is going to press into your mind. But let me tell you this, and this is super important. The only way you can screw up this Christian walk is to quit. That's the only way you can screw this thing up. Whoa, whoa, what do you mean, pastor? Well, you, you can't sing, sin big enough for God to forgive you, can you? 
There, there is no sin. No matter who you are here today, there is nothing that your Jesus won't say, I love you, I believe in you, and we're going to get through this together. You can't find that sin because it doesn't, it doesn't exist. So you can't out -sin him. Well, God's calling me to do, you know, the only way you can fail in the call of God in your life is to be disobedient. Because, and this is how I, I, I've learned to encourage my heart. I, I consider myself a, a three-talent guy. I, I'm not without talents. I, I do have some things that come easily to me that are harder for other people. But I'm never the smartest guy in the room. I'm never the most uh, talented this, that, or the other thing. I've always considered myself to be a three-talent guy. And so if you ever see something working for me, what it means, is that God took my three talents and he multiplied them because I've never been the sharpest one. The, my best trait, if I have one, is tenacity and being too dumb to stop. It, it's, to, it, it's to push on. I, I, I have more stories of failure than, than, than most. I can, you bring up the topic, I can tell you how I've screwed that up 10 times. Or I can also tell you how I did my very best and I still wouldn't know how to do it better. See, I personally believe that God strategically leads us through failure. I think that sometimes He takes you and, and, and brings you into it and brings you out of it. And on the other side of eternity, you're going to be able to, He's going to tell you why. You know, I, I really believe that. Obedience is all God needs from you. It's, that's all he needs from you. You want to make your Jesus smile? I, you know, it's obedience. He, he's not keeping track of how many people you get saved. He's not give, keeping track of, uh, of how much money you give or, or this. All God wants from you is yes. All he, you say, oh, pastor, but I sinned and I failed and I fell down. Well, don't quit. The only way you screw it up is if you quit. Because he will take you back every time. Own your failure. Grab it and run right back to him and say, God, I failed. Take me back again. And, and just, just don't quit. Because his grace is sufficient for you. It was never about your abilities. It was never about you. It was always about you needing salvation. Jesus dying for that salvation. He steps into your life. He saves you. He makes you clean. And then he creates in you who he's always intended you to be. And you get to live the passionate, awesome life that is being grateful in the grind. So don't throw in the towel. God wants you to follow. Somebody said, if you are, anybody going to a, a, a graduation ceremony this fall, this spring, I mean, it was, follow your passion. Find something you love and find a way to make money at it. Well, problem is, uh, a lot of times it don't work out that way. Sometimes you do something that you don't like. And, and I'll tell you this, if you're following God, Part of that process is, you know, maybe you've got something awesome at the end of the road, but I promise you, uh, there are some shovelfuls of concrete in, on the way, okay? They're standing in an assembly line, uh, punching a button on the way. I've never seen anybody be successful unless they had to be learned to be grateful in the grind first. But again, that word successful is not a very good word, is it? Because what's successful? Obedience. And you can be obedient right where you are and, and get to ex experience that. So once you recognize that serving God's... So instead of being a passionate about what you do, how about be passionate about what your God and then let everything do you do glorify Him. Now, and I, I've had some moments in my life like that. I remember I was... Uh, I actually got heat stroke really bad. I was shoveling concrete and I uh, was singing at the time, and, and, and then and I, I puked, because I was, and, and then I just kept shoveling, singing. I, I, used, to ha I used to punch a button, and I, was, I, was, I get distracted easily, so assembly lines are really not good for me, because I kept putting the rivets in the wrong place, and this poor lady, I forgot what her name was, uh, but she got really mad at me, but I was the boss's kid, so she couldn't be too mean to me, because uh, it was my dad's company. And, um, but I, I just, I, I didn't think everybody could hear me. I'm singing as loud as I can. The whole place could hear Scott worshiping and singing. And I did complain to my dad one time and he, about it being boring. And he said, well, what do you want, circus clowns? And he walked away. So he didn't have a lot of compassion for me. Um, but see, when you are doing something for Jesus, you can be grateful in the grind. 
And it doesn't matter if I'm doing something humble for him or if I'm doing something grand for him. I'm just being obedient to him. I, years ago, I thought, I'm going to do all this for God. Well, I need him for all of it. All he needs from you is obedient. However, if you start looking at the pillow too long, you won't be obedient because you just want to lay down. If you look at that shiny thing and you get distracted, you won't be obedient because you want that next shiny thing. If you are in the midst of a failure, either personal, you try to do something, and you want to quit and you decide to quit, it doesn't work. You say yes, yes, yes. And don't go for the pillow. Don't go for the shiny thing. And don't ever throw in the towel because you're God one. He one. Look at this. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord has given me. Now, we know what that task is, right? Because he actually said that, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. The good news of God's grace grace. We're going to pray. And my prayer for you today is that the work would be the reward. The prize that you chase is the process that you get to walk through, that you can be grateful in the grind. Because if you want to serve Jesus, I promise that there are hard days ahead. But it is the most fun. And when you are selfless, it is the most selfish thing you can do, because then you get to punch those rivets with a smile on your face. Because then you can shovel the concrete, sing an amazing grace. Because then, when somebody looks at you and everybody else is grumpy and angry because they hate their job, you can look up and they'll see your smiling face and you know what? You're going to be a good billboard for Jesus. Because in the middle of all those grumpy gusses, somebody's attitude is different. And it's because of the grace of God in you. If you don't feel it, the problem is you, are, you don't quite have in your heart just how saved you are. How much you deserve judgment. How much God brought grace. So if you're here today and you're tempted with the pillow, you're tempted with the shiny thing, or you want to quit, the key is, the secret bullet, is to get back in your heart and mind my Jesus saved me. Jesus died on the cross my sin. He rose from the dead and I get to be forever with him in heaven. When that burns in you, oh, it, every, it just greases every wheel. It raises every attitude. That's the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's your joy. That's what God wants. Work is the reward. The prize is in the process and you can be grateful in the grind. God, we come to you today and I thank you for every person that is here. And Lord, we know that sometimes you ask us to do fun stuff. I'm having fun today. But sometimes you ask us to push through things that are not easy. They're painful and they're hard. But God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to be grateful in the grind. Because sometimes my attitude gets selfish. Sometimes um, my, my attitude gets ugly. And Lord, I just repent of that. And I pray, God, that you would arrest me again with the knowledge and the passion that comes from, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now and I see. Because, Lord, I love the verse that says, when we've been there 10,000 years rejoicing as a son, we've only begun. I get to be forever in heaven with my Jesus. It's enough to keep a smile on my face for the rest of my life. If the smile ever leaves my face, it's because I've stopped looking at the grace. God, I pray I would never, ever stop looking at the grace. That no matter how hard, I do, all I have to do is turn my eyes to you, Jesus, and I see why I do it. I live to make you smile, God. I pray, God, that would be the prayer of every person in this place. I live to make you smile. I live to make you grin, God. That's my purpose. 
In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. Amen. Jesus was a rock star.